Good morning and welcome back to the channel. So, I'm back with another review, but actually in this video, I'm not gonna bring you one review, I'm gonna bring you two. Um, I think I've, I've, I've put together what I believe is quite possibly one of the best macro setups that I've seen, and I'm really pleased with the results of this macro setup. Stay right through to the end of the video, because I'm gonna show you how I get some images such as these, and I'm gonna go through some step-by-step -step instructions on how I put those together. So, the very good people at Lauer, they've contacted me and they've piqued my interest with the um, Lauer 90mm f2.8 Dreamer lens. And um, this has a two times macro. And what that means is it has allows me to give two times magnification of the subject onto the sensor. Now I've done macro photography for a long, long time and I've not really introduced any of it onto my channel. But I do macro photography because I often find that macro uh, photos do really, really well at club competition level. I'll pop some images up, up on the screen now for you to see, and you'll see that these images have done really, really well for me. They've, they've scored well above club standard level, and indeed, on some occasions, they've actually won the competitions for me. Um, and they've all been taken with the Sigma 105 2.8 lens. Um, that has a one times magnification and it's a lens that I've used for many, many years. I, well, I actually, I bought that right at the beginning of COVID um, and most of my lockdown was, was spent in the back garden photographing insects when we couldn't really go out and photograph much else. So the Sigma uh, 105 is a fantastic lens. So I'm gonna compare this new Lauer lens to the Sigma lens. I'm gonna go through all the intricate details for it and tell you exactly what I think of it. I'm gonna do some unboxing. I know they're out in front of me, but I've already unboxed them and I've filmed that, so I'll share that with you shortly. And I'll talk to you about all the different things that these lenses have to offer. Now I said I'm gonna bring you two reviews in one. And that's because after I first went out with this lens, um, I discovered that actually to get the, the shots that I was looking for, I needed to introduce a little bit of artificial light. So I contacted KNF Concept, a company that I've worked with before, and I brought you that trail camera review, which I still use and still think is probably one of the best trail cameras that I've ever used. And I asked them what they could offer me in ways of support for a lighting solution for a macro setup. And what they've sent me is the KNF Concept Macro Ring. Um, this is a, a, an on-lens flash. So rather than the usual setup where we put the, the light on a, a flashlight on the top of the camera and then we have to use diffusers to redirect the light onto the subject, this puts the lighting solution right on the end of the lens. So I'm gonna be going through a little bit of a review for that is, uh, with you as well. I genuinely believe that the, co uh, the co combination of the two gives me an absolutely wonderful macro setup. Couple of things to note. The first one is when you unbox this and you look at this lens, you'll notice that there are absolutely no contacts on the end of the lens. And that's because this lens doesn't talk to your camera at all. Everything is totally manual. So the aperture control is via a manual ring. Um, and that's a really, really, you know, very clear, you get a, a click when it drops into the various different apertures. And that goes all the way from f2.8 round to f22. And then the focusing on this is also a manual focus. And the throw of the focus is really long. Um, now on, on some lenses that would be a problem, but actually on a macro lens, you want it to be a long throw. And the reason that you want it to be a long throw is that you can do very, very small micro adjustments, which allow you to uh, adjust through various different focal planes on your subject, which is really important when it comes to stacking and something that I'll show you at the end of the video. So the first thing that I'm gonna do, I'm gonna pop this lens onto my camera and we're gonna jump across to Stratford-upon-Avon where we visit a butterfly farm and hopefully get some shots. I've got my coffee ready. I'm sure you've got yours too. So sit back, relax and see what I see.
Oh, so, so that that one actually clipped my ear as went past as soon as you come in they're everywhere we've got them on the plants landed here taking some shots now i did say i'd give you some tips and so the reason why having it not on um on automatic focus is really really useful what i do is i find the, the subject and then i rock in whilst taking the shots and the the idea being there as you slowly rock in, as you slowly rock in, you'll get a, a series of images that you can stack if you need to stack them. Now, actually, these butterflies are uh, horizontal to, to the, uh, the camera, so the plane of focus will match them perfectly. And um, so you don't really, you don't really need to worry about it. Oh, it's going to be so good in here. So to increase my depth of field, I was going at f22, um, and then I've been reviewing the images on the back of the camera, and for me, they're just at f22, they're just a little bit soft, so what I've actually done now is, I've opened up the aperture, there's not a lot of light in here, despite it looking like there is. Uh, oh, I've opened up the aperture, um, increased the shutter speed a little bit, bring the ISO down, and I'm gonna go again and see what I can get differently this time, uh, just taking into account that my depth of field will be very, very shallow. So a couple of things that I've uh, picked up on the lens already. Um, I've only been using it for sort of 20 minutes, half an hour. Um, is that actually shooting wide open it isn't necessarily a problem. And particularly in somewhere like this where you haven't got lots of light and the fact that it will stop down all the way to 2.8 is fantastic. You just have to accept that you've got a very shallow depth of field. And then based on that, you're gonna obviously take your photograph thinking about that depth of field and where that plane of field uh, lies. I'm sweating like crazy, it's so hot in here. Um, there are butterflies absolutely everywhere and the real key here is to find a perch that you've got a reasonably uh, clear background, unobstructed and certainly with nothing that looks uh, unnatural. So that's what you're looking for all the time as you're moving around. Um, and then it's just a case of, of waiting in a spot but equally moving around, finding your subject. I use that rocking motion with the camera of rocking in and out whilst holding the shutter speed button down. So I've got a series of images and then hopefully one of those images will be sharp and in focus. The butterfly farm was absolutely fantastic. The only problem was it was busy. It was a very, very busy day and there were lots and lots of people. And I apologize for the background noise on the video. It made vlogging a real, real challenge. But hopefully, from that experience, you can see that the, 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 the lens and the camera setup is absolutely ideal for in-close uh, shots of, of subjects. I'll share with you now some of the images that I've got and I'll talk you through how I've put those together. So this first image is an image I took whilst I was in the garden of the property we were staying in. And it's a common garden wasp. Um, 
what I like about this image is it just shows all the hairs on the body and the level of detail that's achievable with this lens. This image is of a butterfly species I have absolutely no idea of. It was a beautiful subject and landed long enough for me to grab five shots using the rocking method I previously explained. I have put the images into Photoshop as layers and then auto aligned them. I then make a crop to remove any uneven edges and to improve the composition. I then use Auto Blend in Photoshop to focus stack the images. My only disappointment in this shot is the white area in the background, which I feel is a little distracting. For this image of a malachite butterfly, I have stacked 18 shots, all shot wide open at f2.8. I use the focus ring with tiny, tiny movements while shooting at 20 frames per second. The images were then blended in the same way as the previous shot using Photoshop. When the butterflies appear flat like this, the temptation is to just take a single shot. This has actually been photo stacked from eight different images because although the butterfly appears flat, the wings were slightly upturned, which meant that the tips of the wing on a single shot would have been out of focus. This is my favorite shot taken on the trip. It's of a large postman, a beautifully colored butterfly, the perch, a simple leaf looks completely natural and the background nicely diffused and unobstructed. The shot consists of 18 images of the butterfly using the focus ring method I explained previously, all blended together in Photoshop. So the real challenge there in the, in the butterfly farm was light. Now, although on the video it looked quite bright in there, invariably the butterflies were under canopy on branches and there wasn't a great deal of light there and it made photographing a real challenge. Um, to get that depth of field, I initially kind of wound the aperture right up to f22. But I think through diffraction, what we ended up with there was images that in my opinion were a little bit soft. So I opted for a much wider aperture, which allowed mo a lot more light to come in through the lens and then to, to uh, work towards photo stacking, so stacking those images together. And as I said in the video, I used two methods for doing that. The first method is once you've got your subjects in front of you, holding down the shutter, uh, shutter button, and I'm shooting at 20 frames per second, and then very slowly rocking in and out, so that as we're moving in and out, it's taking those photographs, and we're hopefully getting lots of images through the different focal planes. The second method that I used is to hold the camera in place, and then to use the focal ring, and the fact that it's got this really long throw, and then I'd be, do exactly the same again. I'd be taking shots, and I'd just be rotating the focus ring to ensure that I'm getting shots through the, the, the different planes of focus. Two completely different methods. Um, in my opinion, the, the moving of the focal ring in that instance was actually a much more effective method. And the reason for that is when you're rocking in and out, you're moving towards the subject. If the, if the subject's not used to that, they'll fly away. Um, and, and I found on a number of occasions, as I was rocking in and out to the subjects, it would fly away. Whereas if I was static in one position and got myself into a position where it was comfortable and it settled, I could move that focus plane using the focal ring, the focusing ring, and, and the, the, the subject never moved. So I got much more results in doing that. So, Upon reviewing my images, I was quite pleased with some of those images. Um, I've put this image into my club uh, photo competition and the judge gave it a 17. So that's club standard, so it's 17 out of 20. And I'm pleased with that. I, that was an image that I'd, I'd uh, used fo focus stacking. I put lots of images together. There was lots of detail in it. Um, and on the night, there were just better images than mine. Um, and so 17, I was happy with, you know, if you're getting a 17, I think at a club competition level, you know you're at the standard of your club. So I decided to get in touch with KNF Concept, um, a brand that I've worked with closely in the past. And as you'll remember, I brought the trail camera to you, the 4G trail camera, which I'm still using now. It's an absolutely fantastic piece of kit. So I got in contact with KNF Concept and to, just to see if they could help me out in providing some form of lighting solution for macro lenses and for macro work. And so what they've sent me is their macro ring flash. Now this is um, specific towards a Nikon, uh, so it has got TTL, so it works in, in uh, manual and auto mode with, with TTL. And the beauty of these is that it puts the flash around the lens. 
Um, normally what you're working with is a flash above the camera, on top of the camera, and then you're add, adding diffusers and you're trying to redirect the light to where you want the photograph to be. In addition to that, what often happens is as you're you've got all this monstrosity of stuff over the top of you, you get some quite nasty shadows uh, and it's quite contrasty. So I was really interested to give this a try. So I've just received it. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna unbox it, have a look at it, get it on the camera, and then let's get some test images. I've actually already noticed on the table at the back of me, I've got um, a little jumping spider um, and they're fantastic to photograph. They've got four big, beautiful eyes and they've almost got eyelashes on their eyes. So I'll get some images with that using this flash and I'll give you the, a, a bit of a review on how good this is for your macro work. Okay, straight away, first thing that's worth noticing, I love it when companies do things like this. It's really, really simple. It probably doesn't cost them a lot of money, but in terms of somebody who's a bit of a kit fiend and I like everything to be tidied away, it's come in its own carry pouch, which means I can put the box away um, and then I can just use this carry pouch and keep it all nice and safe inside that. That's a fantastic addition. Okay, so inside, we've got the, the flash, okay? And you can see there, it's a uh, multi-flash, so you can control where the light's coming in. And I believe you can control the power on each side of it, so you can create a, a fill light and a key light on your subjects. So it'd be interesting to see how that works. And then that's the flash unit itself. Now that sits on top of your camera, and then that, with the extended lead, goes out to the front of your lens. So it'll look something along those lines on your camera. And I'll pop that on in a minute and show you. So there you have it. You've got your flash on the front of the lens um, and it means that you can bring things very, very close to the front of that lens and you're not having to worry about your shadows and your lighting because your flash is all in place. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna get some batteries, pop the batteries in, get the flash fired up and let's see what it looks like. Okay, so I've had a quick read through the manual um, and basically it is completely um, controllable, the light that you've got. So you've got two flashes, one on the left hand side, one on the right hand side. And then at the top and the bottom, you've got what we would normally refer to in a studio as modeling lights. Um, and what the modeling lights are for is if you're working in a very low light situation, the modeling lights will pro project enough light to allow you to focus on your subject. Now that's probably really important if you are using autofocus, but as I've explained to you previously, um, the lower is all manual, uh, manual. It has no autofocus. It has no um, automatic uh, aperture control from the camera. Um, everything is controlled via the lens. Um, and what that means is that I have full control of what I'm gonna do. Now I can use that in TTL mode, but actually I've just done a couple of test shots on um, some flowers at the side of me. And whilst TTL mode is producing some nice images, I think when you're out in daylight, you need to be able to control the light in a much more finer way. And um, so I've used it in full, in full uh, manual mode. And what that allows me to do is to control the strength of the flashes from both sides. Now that's really, really creative because normally we're projecting a flash from a speed light off the top of the camera and that allows us to project light enough to be able to create the shot. But what we'll get is often quite a flat light. Um, and then even with the use of diffusers, what we often get is we get quite nasty shadows, uh, anything below the subject. Whereas this, I can control where I want the light to go. So if I want more of the light on the left-hand side of the, of the um, subject and the light to fall off, but not into complete shadow, so I just want some light on the right-hand side, this lens, this flash allows me to do that because I can control the strength of the power of each side of the flash. And then all I do is once I've got my focus in position, I just hold the, the, the flash, or I can, I can let it loose, um, get my focus into position, and then I take the shot. And as a result of that, I'm getting fantastic results. Okay, so I've got my first test subject all set up. Now, for macro photography, one of the things that I quite like to do is to look for dead flies that are on a windowsill. I know that seems a little bit of a morbid thing to do, but actually dead flies are really good for macro photography. They don't move. Um, and as long as they've died pretty much naturally on a windowsill, they're usually in pristine condition. 
So what I do is I get a set of tweezers and I use the tweezers to position the fly, the, the, the fly exactly as I want it. Okay, so what I've got is I've got my, my dead fly. I couldn't even tell you what kind of fly it was. Um, if I find out, I'll pop it up on the screen for you. Now I'm working outside at the moment. It'd probably be optimal to work inside, but for the sake of the video and without me introducing studio lights for filming me, um, I'm filming outside. Now I love doing macro on this uh, glass top table. And the reason for that is you get some nice reflections of the insect. Now, because it's an insect in isolation, I've not put it on a leaf or anything like that. I could do, um, it's about getting a really, really sharp subject, a really, really sharp picture of the subject. And what I'm doing is I'm actually focus stacking. For a focus stack shot, what you need is you need the image, you need the subject to be absolutely still. Um, and because I'm outside, there is a little bit of a breeze, hardly any, but there is a little bit. So I've built myself, using the boxes of the, the lens and the, and the flash, I've built myself just a little bit of a, a corridor where the, the, the breeze is a little less. It's not perfect, and every now and again we get, we get a slightly stronger gust of wind and the subject moves as it is doing at the minute. As it stands, that, that's exactly as you want it. Now, the lower lens, it is really, really good for focus stacking. And the reason why it's really, really good for focus stacking is that the um, focus ring is really quite stiff and it's got a very, very long throw on it. Now, the reason why that, that stiff, long throw focus ring is really, really good for focus stacking. What I've done here is I've set everything up. I've got the camera in the position that I want it. Um, so I've got my, my uh, bug at the back there and all I'm going to do is I'm going to keep rotating the focus ring ever so slowly through the different planes of focus so it always covers the entire subject from front to back. And all I'm doing with every sort of the tiniest little movement on the, on the ring, all I'm going to do then is just take another shot. And as I move through, I keep taking a shot. Now I've got the flash all set up. The flash is set so that it's even light across the subject. So I'm going with a 16th power on either side of the, of the, uh, of the flash. And so I'm gonna give that even light. And that's gonna be really important for my, for my stacked shot. So my first shot is gonna be just out of focus so that the whole subject will be blurred just out of, out of shot. And I'm gonna take the shot. Now I'm gonna just move that focus ring ever so slightly. And I'm going to take a shot. I'm going to move that focus ring ever so slightly. Take the shot. And again. And again. Now it's really important when you're doing a focus stack such as this that you go from front to back or back to front. It doesn't, it doesn't make any difference the order that you do it. But you start out of focus and you keep adjusting all the way through till beyond where you think is in focus. Um, and the reason for that is it's amazing how many times I've done a focus stack and I've done what I think is the correct amount of images and I've missed the tip of the wing. We're talking less than a millimeter in terms of um, the focal plane, in terms of the depth of field. And so we're really slicing it one after another, after another, all the way through. So keep going till you've got all the way through, through that subject. Now, another thing that's worth mentioning, you'll notice what I'm going to do now, is I'm going to put my hand in front of the camera and take a shot. Now, the reason that I do that is that that signals where the end of that stack was, and it stops me confusing different images and trying to stack images where the flies move considerably. Okay, so we've got the Lauer 2.8 Dreamer macro lens. And I said at the start what I would do is I'd compare it to the Sigma lens. And I'm gonna go through now and just tell you some of the things that make these lenses different and what the advantages and disadvantages of each of the lenses are. So straight away, I'm gonna to talk to you about the two times magnification. 
That two times magnification really does make a difference. It allows me to get much, much more detail, the finer detail, the, the kind of micro, macro detail of my subject. And that in, in itself makes this a truly wonderful lens. There are some limitations to the lens. I think the first one is if you're not used to using a manual focus lens um, and a manual aperture lens, a lens that requires you to do everything for it, it takes a bit of getting used to. Um, I think with today's technology, we're so used to using the, the auto focusing systems in our camera that actually we forget sometimes how to, to manually focus. And I know that sounds quite simple, but, but we do. And it took me a little bit of adjusting to have my manual focus lens in place. I think if you were using this for various different other um, types of photography, the manual focus is a huge disadvantage. Um, I took it out into Stratford-upon-Avon um, just to kind of use it for a little bit of street photography um, and do a little bit of landscape work with it and some portrait work with it. And I found that the, the manual focus was something that was a little bit frustrating, particularly when I wasn't using the, the, uh, the camera on a tripod. And that's perhaps because I've become so reliant on the autofocus systems that we've got in place. Um, the Sigma lens is fully um, automatic. So it's got autofocus, it's got that auto aperture, everything that a modern lens would have. However, it's noisy, it's really noisy. So it's got um, image stabilization in it and that image stabilization, I often turn off because the image stabilization means that it's quite a noisy lens. And if you're photographing anything, as we often are in macro, that's a little bit sensitive to movement to noise or anything like that, at times that lens is that noisy, it puts it off. There is no uh, image stabilization in the lower lens. So you do have to account for that, particularly with your shutter speed. So you need to make sure that your shutter speeds are accounting for any camera shake that you might have. Again, something that we don't think about with modern lenses with the amount of image stabilization that's in the lenses, in your camera body itself. Um, we tend to photograph with much slower shutter speeds than we perhaps can do on a, on a fully manual lens. So it's just a little bit of learning that's required. However, for true macro, you're probably going to be photographing on a tripod anyway, as I was with the, with the fly. And if you're photographing on a tripod, none of that matters. You don't have to worry about your camera shake. You don't have to worry about um, your shutter speeds because the, the, the tripod is stabilizing that lens for you. And in that instance, I think that the macro lens, the lower macro lens is absolutely first class. If you're somebody that wants to do on the move macro photography, so you don't want to be setting up, you don't want to be using tripods, you don't want to be very, very static. I would suggest that something like the Sigma is probably a little bit more appropriate for that type of photography. The image, image stabilization and the autofocusing system makes it really, really user friendly. But if you want some real quality macro where you're getting really close to your subject and particularly if you're starting to introduce focus stacking where you're taking several tens, tens, even hundreds of shots and then stacking them together afterwards to get that um, depth of field throughout the subject, you realistically do need to be using a tripod for that. And at that point, the, the autofocusing system and the image stabilization is null and void. So if you want something that's gonna capture really, really sharp, quality images, then I would suggest that the lower 90 millimeter macro lens is the one for you. Um, the KNF Concept Flash, fantastic bit of flash that is. What a fantastic flash. Um, I'm actually gonna use that instead of a speed light on the top. I think the fact that I can control the light on each side of the flash means that it's really versatile. Um, I like the fact that I can put my light really close to my subject. So for macro work, that is absolutely ideal. I've seen setups where we have multiple flashes that come to the outsides of the lens, um, and they're a little bit cumbersome. And again, when you're photographing small bugs, small insects, they're really sensitive to things like that, you know, big, big things coming towards them. This is a little bit more discreet, and as a result of that, I've used it a number of times with various different subjects and they're not, that, they're not that fussed as that's coming towards them. So if you're interested in purchasing any of these items, so whether that be the KNF Concept, not the Sigma lens, the KNF Concept uh, macro ring flash, or the uh, lower macro lens, 
I've got some discount codes and I'll put, pop those into the description below. They'll get you a little bit of discount if you're interested in purchasing those. My k &F Concept discount code, uh, which I'll pop up on screen now, will work for any items in the k &F store. So feel free to use those and get that discount. Um, it's really worthwhile doing so. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. I hope you've enjoyed the reviews that I've brought to you. If you're interested in macro photography and you're looking at tr trying to put together a little bit of a setup, maybe you'll introduce the lower lens to you and the k &F concept. If you've enjoyed this video, give it a like. Drop me a comment in the box below. If there's anything in particular you'd like me to review, um, I've, got, <laughs> I've got lots of things that are new at the moment, which I'm, I'm hoping I'm going to do some reviews for you. Um, I've just purchased a new microphone system, so I've got the DJI Twin Mic set up mainly for when I'm out with Pops. I didn't think Pops was being able to be heard enough on the video, so I've got him his own microphone now so you can hear him that bit better. Um, I've actually just bought a new lens. Uh, I've sold the Nikon 500mm uh, Prime, my old battle axe, my F4G VR, um, and I've treated myself. I'd show you the scar on my back where I've cut the kidney out to sell it um, to be able to fund this, but I've actually bought the Nikon 400mm, Z400mm 2.8 with the built-in teleconverter. A ridiculously expensive lens. Um, it took me a lot of persuading of my wife to allow me to purchase it, but wow, what a lens it is. And I'm looking forward to bringing that to you very, very soon. So until next time, ta -ra.